good evening, everybody. It's just me here at the moment. Got Beth and Lear in the kitchen. They'll be along shortly. Oh, not just me. I do have company. Here's Mr. Miko. But hope everybody's having a pretty good week. Uh, looks like it's just going to be us this week, as in no Vibe Radio Network this week. They appear to be down with technical difficulties. So, uh, just us in the Facebook Live realm, and uh, again, yeah, hope you all have been doing pretty well, having a good week going on here. I'll give folks just a moment to go ahead and catch up with us, and then we'll kind of get things rolling for the week. issues here too. That's better. All right, got it. Hey Patrick, good evening. Yes, we are live. Oh, we're live. We're yeah. having... It's 8.30, we're live. I'm sorry, the bartender's a little late here. So is Lee. I got here right in time though. You're here, it's, it, we're... Did you mute me over there? Mute you? Why would I mute you? So my phone doesn't make funky sounds? Funky sounds? Maybe that phone will be muted. Yeah. It's, it's muted. It's muted. Okay. Hi, guys. Yeah. Nice uh, I don't know. I don't know if everything's muted. Everything. Because, yeah. Things are a little. Oh. Filter, stilter. That one's not muted. All right. Now everything seems to be muted. All right. So. Yes, I'm putting a blanket on my cold feet right now. <laughs> I'm <laughs> just so freaking jealous. <laughs> I have ice cream feet. They are cold constantly. I, see, I usually am. I'm, I'm like a dead person normally, but here's the deal. It's hot out there. It is toasty. And I have not been outside since I came home. Mm -hmm. why, would, why would we want to? <laughs> Guys, the rain didn't help. <laughs> what rain? Yeah, right. Rain. Yeah. We got a little down here. Uh, of course it did. Yeah, I got like five sprinkles on my drive back. I'm like, yeah, rain. No, we went that way. Uh, so, cheers! Wait, cheers, everybody. We <laughs> got our stormy, just yep. in case. Hopefully, dark and stormy, yes, we got our dark and stormies stormy. because that's what we. Well, and it's what we had for tonight. Mm -hmm. Did we finally kill it? I think I killed it. <laughs> All right. So, anyways, yes. What have we been up to? A lot. I mean, it feels like we've been busy. Been, you know, doing the tour thing every night. Yep. We actually have, tonight is off, no tours tonight. Yes. We're here instead. We're, well, we're here, but I mean, there are no tours tonight, yeah, so. Nobody booked for tonight. Nobody booked for tonight, so just, uh, just us and you for this evening. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, cats. And okay. cats. And Lee. And Lee, yes. Well, that's Our part of the us. Us. Oh. That's part yeah, of us. You're a part of us. Mm -hmm. That's part of the entity. Guys! <laughs> well, let's see. We got we do have tours going on for the rest of the week. Yes. Churchill tomorrow, Shaco Wednesday, Franklin Street Thursday. I'm in Shaco, right? On Wednesday? Uh, yes. I think so, yes. And Zoe is launching it. Gotcha. Yep. So if you guys want to come see me and Z, we're, we're a fun couple. Yeah. saying. That's going to be 7.30 on Wednesday. 730. 730. Because it was the pick your own tour thing. So and that's what I got picked. My like church picked. was pick your own and that's what I got picked. Yep. And if uh, there are plenty of opportunities in the uh, the weeks and months ahead for you to do your own pick your own tour if you are so inclined. And I hope you are so inclined. It's kind of a fun concept and gives you the opportunity to pick what you want to do on a given night. <laughs> the so, boys are cuddling daddy a lot. Baby. But, um, so we got that going on and uh, a couple tours Friday, a couple tours Saturday, and and on Saturday. Q. Comic Con! Comic Con. Hang on, let me do my impression of my boss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, you gotta come to Virginia Comic Con on Saturday. It's gonna be super duper fun. We can come and cosplay and Haunts of Richmond will be there. Do not tell Brett. <laughs> <laughs> My lips are sealed. I won't be in town, so I can't tell him. Oh, 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 oh don't, not, don't tell about the impression. Mm -hmm. Noted, noted, noted. It's like, why should we mention that we're going to be there? I mean, we, 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 we got a... We got Brett a, knows. <laughs> we got a nice corner table, and, and Lee and Marsha are going to be working the table. Yep, mm -hmm. lots of spooky jewelry, lots of uh, spooky books. 
spooky stickers. Yep. Talking about tour stuff. So yeah. Yep. And other things. We'll talk about anything you want, honestly. Yep. So right definitely back. come check them out. And um, then we got a, another full week of tours next week with next Friday or next excuse me. Saturday. The following Saturday on the twenty eighth. It will be just before we come back and talk to you on Facebook Live again. We will be uh, having our John Marshall House tour again, and uh, this is the last one until after October. Yep. So it'll so. be uh, at least a few months before we do the John Marshall House thing again. So if you want to join us for it, uh, this will be your last chance to do that for a little while. But yeah. So did, yeah. did a portal open up over there? Because you are really into the scary. Yep. But anyways, yeah, we got stuff going on. Yep. But yeah, for, for for tonight, for tonight, where uh, we are here to talk to you about haunted Toronto. So we love Toronto. It's been a little while when we, since we've been there. I've mm -hmm. never been. A hot minute, if you will. Yes. It, it's it's part of that our like first official vacations together as a couple. It was. Oh. It was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Somehow we managed to swing that. We came down right. from where we were living on the northern tier of New York. Caught a train in Kingston and took the three-hour train ride down to Toronto. And it was a great weekend. We yep. got to see Lion King live. Um, we got to go to some, some great restaurants. Mm -hmm. Got to stay at one of the places we're talking about. Was it the Royal York that we stayed at on that one? Yeah. It was? I thought oh, no, 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 no. That, that was that's what we did with your parents. Yes. Okay. I think we stayed at the, the, the Chelsea. Chelsea, yeah, yes. the first time. Yep. Another great hotel there yep. in downtown Toronto. The, Toronto has a lot of great downtown. I would hotels. love to get back to Toronto. They have a lot of great stuff, period. Which is part of the reason why we want to go ahead and talk about them tonight. Yeah. Because it's an awesome, awesome, awesome city. place to go to. Great food, great boutique ho uh, hotels, great um, boutique shops, and antique places. Um, I mean, it's just a great place to go and visit. So, yeah. And baseball and hockey, so you can't go wrong. Yeah. And uh, speaking of which, just real quick, before we do dive into the stories for this evening, do you want to make a quick mention of the fact that this is not the first time that we've talked about Toronto. Toronto has been featured on several of our previous episodes. Of course, we did a actual Haunted Canada episode, which had a couple of stops in Toronto. Uh, we also, uh, on our Spirits of the Sporting World episode, we talked about the Hockey Hall of Fame. Yes, and, that one was fun. <laughs> And what was the... Uh, there's a couple others. I know there are a couple others, but anyways, um, yes, not the first time we talked about Toronto, and uh, I'm sure, sure it will not be the last. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right, Haunted, um, Haunted University's Part 1. You know, two an impressive memory. Yeah. <laughs> two, I went back and looked. Oh, I did. I cheated. <laughs> but two weeks from now, we're doing <coughs> Haunted University's Part 2, but we did feature the University of Toronto on Haunted University's Part 1. <coughs> And that was, oh, about three years ago, so. <coughs> Excuse me. Are we going to make another Drink. ghost? Well, what? Are we going to make another ghost? Nope, not tonight. Gotcha. Yeah, he's not allowed to. Not allowed to. So, anyways, <laughs> yes, you can check out those Toronto stories, but to kick off tonight, I'll let Beth go ahead and start running with it as I start to uh, catch up on some comments here. Yes. So we're going to start on Gerard Street East at the Old Dawn Jail. Um, this is, of course, east of the Don River, which flows quietly through downtown Toronto on its way to Lake Ontario. Here, just, just off of Gerard Street, looms a large stone structure uh, that now serves as an administrative office building. However, a closer look at the commemorative plaque outside reveals a very different past. The plaque describes the history of the Don Jail, the embodiment of progressive ideas that penal reform uh, was when it was built back in 1859. Y'all, we've talked about prisons from this time period and what the reform ideas were. They weren't fantastic. Anyway, back then, this included two wings, one for the men, another for the women, as well as a farm located at present-day Riverdale Park was worked by the prisoners. Compared to other prisons of the areas uh, which restricted inmates into their cells, Don was indeed considered progressive. <coughs> that said, the architecture of the jail seems to be designed to intimidate. The face of Father Time glaring down from over the portico, inside the main rotunda, iron ca cast iron brackets fashioned into the shape of griffins and serpents hold up balconies outside the cells, from which some are, you know, no more than one to three meters in size. I'm sorry, which jail is this? I had to look this up. Don Jail. D-O-N. The old Don, Don Jail. jail. 
<laughs> now, prisoners were not just sent to the Don to do time, many were sent there to die. Some 70 executions would be carried out in the gallows, including the last one in Canada on December 11th of 1962. Now, prior to 1905, the executions took place outside, and Torontonians would huddle beyond the wall that was used to surround the property and take in the spectacle. One such occasion was March 10th of 1905, when 22-year-old Alexander Martin, who was condemned to die for drowning his newborn, protested his innocence as the hangman's noose was lowered over his head. According to an account of the execution published in the Globe, Martin swore at the protesters but had earlier confessed to the murder. His story, however, wouldn't end there. His bones would be among the remains of 15 men that were discovered on the property in 2007 during a redevelopment of the site by the Bridgepoint Health Rehabilitation Hospital. The bodies were reburied in unmarked graves in the Rosedale Valley. The discovery unearthed other horrifying secrets that up until that point had been kept behind the Don's walls, including the legend of a blonde-haired ghost. It was in the Don Jail that one of its tiniest cells was reserved for women in the West Wing. That prisoner hung herself in the 1890s. It was said that she fashioned a noose from the bedsheets in her cell. Since that day, many have witnessed her lingering spirit floating through the air across the second level. She appears to be flustered, perhaps angry, pacing side to side, her white gown swaying in the haze around her. Now, in the prison days, the guards feared an encounter with the Lady of the Dawn, as she became known. Though she never actually attacked anyone, the menacing way that this spirit carries herself is chilling at best. It's an interesting turn for a prison that was better known for its violent and fearsome male inmates. In another incident, on the late November night in 2005, a guard was making his rounds through the day area of the jail. This is when the area that the this is excuse me the area that the inmates would be allowed to access during the day to get exercise. But a century before, it was the space that was used for public executions. Like most prison entrances and exits, the day area featured a set of two gates, only one of which could be opened at a time. So that as a prisoner enters the day area, a gate behind him must close before passing through the gate in front. Within the day area is a punching bag suspended by a chain, and even through the night, the day area is lit somewhat so that the guards can ensure that no one is out there when they shouldn't be. At 2 a.m., the guard was making his rounds when an inmate yelled out that he had been woken up by somebody hitting the bag. When the bag is hit, the chain that suspends it rattles very loudly. The guard had a few, clear view of the prisoner and of the punching bag, and there was nobody surrounding it. For someone to hit the bag, they would have to escape the lock sails, pass through both gates, an impossibility, but still the guard did a head count and all the prisoners were accounted for. Later that night, when another guard was on the rounds, two more inmates were woken up by the sound of the punching bag. This guard also counted the inmates who were all locked up, I could see that the punchy bag was unattended and stationary. Then further off into that night, as two more officers were making their rounds together, another inmate complained of being woken up by the punchy bag. Again, they looked out, but this time the punchy bag was clearly swinging from having been hit, yet no one's in sight. The old Don Jail has closed its doors to prisoners in 2013, but it didn't stay vacant for long. No word on if the workers of the renovated administrative building have had any spirited encounters since they moved in. Regardless, it has earned itself the reputation of being one of Toronto's most haunted buildings. Hey, buddy. Tree. Hey. <laughs> are we going to play or are you going to cuddle? All right. So, moving along from the old Don Jail, we're going to go to a location uh, kind of a little bit well, at least at first, sounds a little less sinister. <laughs> at least at first. <laughs> Before Toronto was incorporated in 1834, the St. Lawrence Market, then known as the Market Block, formed the epicenter of the town of York. The market served as the hub of commerce for the community, as well as the cultural center of town. It was also a mostly inhospitable and foreboding place. They didn't call it Muddy York just because the streets would turn into a muddy mess after a hard rain. Early settlers looking to earn their keep mixed with merchants from out of town, 
eager to sell their wares, and vagabonds brought by ship into Toronto Harbor from places unknown. Drinking and public nuisances were common, and the local authorities gave no quarter. The market was where public floggings took place. There was no constabulary, uh, constabulary? Yes. to speak of, so public shaming and ridicule were how the authorities kept law and order. Shaming. You could just as easily be pilloried for the simple act of being a nuisance as well as sedition. It was like Salem, only with a decidedly different kind of witch hunt that didn't involve burning at the stake. That's not to and yes, we know Salem, they didn't burn people at the stake. We know. It's just a turn of phrase. Very cliche, wrong turn yes. of phrase. So, we went through it in for a reason. Bear with me. That is not to say that Toronto was flame-free. The Great Toronto Fire of 1849 turned much of the city to ash, including the St. Lawrence Market. There's the tide. Ah, yeah. Bernie, Bernie. Flamey bits. It would be replaced with a brick structure that would also house the city's first city hall, a police station, and jailhouse, alongside the thriving market. In the sub-basement of the building, away from the eyes of merchants and shoppers, metal anchors held prisoners chained to the walls. While they may have been out of sight, it is said that their screams could be heard on the street. The tormented souls of the prisoners seem to linger at the modern market, even though the government facilities have long since relocated to other parts of town. Local historian Bruce Bell was a frequent visitor to the market, taking guests there as a part of a dark history tour. At first, Bruce claimed the market was not haunted, but that all changed while he was giving a tour in the market's basement area, and a guest had asked him if he had ever seen a ghost. Before Bell could answer no, the guest's camera had flown from her hand, the lights began to flicker, and a loud banging noise could be heard from behind the bricked-off door located in the room. After an awkward moment of silence, Bell responded, I have now. While there have been no official documentation of paranormal activity happening in St. Lawrence Market, shopkeepers and staff have noticed the occasional weird occurrence. The sound of footsteps coming up empty stairs, lights randomly flickering on and off, and the floorboards squeaking under the pressure of un some unseen force. Could this be the ghost of some poor wretched soul who found themselves chained to the wall in the basement a century and a half ago? or someone or something from the past coming back for revenge. In its crime and punishment days, it's estimated that about 100 people were condemned to death in the courtroom that also used to be in the basement of the old city hall. That's to say nothing of those who died while being chained to the sub-basement wall. And while it might be tempting to attribute all the spirits to this facet of the building's history, there may be at least one other spirit lingering about the space as well. In 1857, the 13th mayor of Toronto, John Hutchinson, quietly faded from the public eye under a cloud of scandal. He would leave Toronto and nearly disappeared from the pages of history. John Hutchinson was born in Scotland in 1817 and moved with his parents to Montreal in 1828. In 1847, he would move to Toronto, where he opened an importing business on Church Street. For the next, thir or excuse me, the next ten years, as his business grew, Hutchinson started to take an active part in the political and social affairs of the city. He was elected mayor in 1857 and took to his office at the City Hall building attached to the market. Unfortunately for Hutchinson, he entered office at an economically volatile point in history. When Hutchinson took office, the 23-year-old city of Toronto was on the tail end of a wave of immense economic growth, largely due to the development of the railroads. But despite this, a dark cloud was quickly approaching. The economy was already slowing rapidly and was on the verge of collapse. To add insult to injury, the Great City Works project of building a people's esplanade along the harbor fell through when the railroad threatened to build along Queen Street if they couldn't have the right-of-way along the harbor. Despite a public outcry, the railroad won and, under Hutchinson's counsel, received thousands of acres of land along the waterfront once destined for parkland. The newly minted mayor of Toronto was already in the doghouse in the eyes of the public. 
Mayor Hutchinson had hoped that the railroad project would buttress the local economy, but it was not to be. The economy continued to fold in on itself, and Mayor Hutchinson was already considered a massive failure just after a few months in office. Hutchinson, a once well-respected businessman and political figure in Toronto, left the mayor's office within a year of his election. He shuttered his struggling businesses and boarded a train for Montreal, leaving the city they had helped build, beyond, helped build behind forever. Hutchinson, who never married and had no children, was never heard from again. Some say the unexplained noises coming from the west stairwell of the old city hall at St. Lawrence Market and the loud clanging noises that go thump in the night are all made by the ghost of John Hutchinson coming back to say he's sorry for the havoc, havoc he was partly responsible for during one of the darkest times in Toronto's history. That's very hopeful. <laughs> Even if it's not him, it's an interesting chapter yeah, of Toronto's it history. It's not like it's not very often that a mayor basically resigns their office and then effectively disappears from the historic record. True. I mean, they do think it like after a century after the guy died, they think that they found an obituary from a Montreal newspaper that was referring to him. Um, so, but that was basically it. So, a little like Poe's dad, he probably died at some point. Yeah. We know that he probably died at some point, but yeah. we don't know when. Yeah. He could still be out there. No, he's not. That's a I, I was going to say, are you going to start trying to tie him into the Richmond Vampire story? Um, so it is a joke that I do tell on <laughs> its tour. I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Noted. <laughs> Noted. All right, moving on. Moving along. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to talk about St. Michael's Hospital. It opened its uh, original location on Bond Street in 1892. It was located in a Baptist church that had been converted into a boarding house and was run by the Sisters of St. Joseph, a Catholic order of nuns founded in ancient France in the 17th century. The hospital would start with a modest 26 beds. By 1910, the hospital would formally become affiliated with the University of Toronto, and many medical firsts would follow, including the first successful blood transfusion and heart transplant in North America. The nuns that used to act as nurses are no longer a fixture, but their tradition continues in the story of Sister ben Benicia, Vinnie, as she's known by the staff, died back in the 1950s. Since 1965, visitors and staff have described encounters with Sister Venicia or Vinny, which often included her rearranging medications, giving blankets to new mothers, and turning the lights on and off. And she's still occasionally seen making her rounds, typically with her black chasm and, of course, excuse me, wear a black hat. Reboot. <laughs> where you would see a black chasm where her face should be. Chasm. Chasm. It's not there. Face, no face. Yeah, she's a no face. No face. Anyway, it turns out that Sister Vinnie isn't alone in haunting the medical center. In fact, the hospital records show an extensive list of varied ghostly experiences over the years, many of which do not match the description of Sister Vinnie. I wonder if they have an X Files like our Capitol Police officers do. Wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> As one story goes, an IT employee was working late one Saturday evening. He was alone and heard people rush, rustling behind him. As he turned around and felt something pass through him, the wind was knocked out of him. When he regained his breath and told his co-worker about the incident, she explained earlier that she was watering a plant when it began to move and shake viciously. <laughs> Is this what you're after? Ready? <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be that night, folks. All right, another heart-stopping event uh, was actually experienced by a porter. You recall the terrifying break that they took when working an overnight shift at the hospital. As they were minding their own business and making the most of their short break, all the lights on the room suddenly cut off, and the door to the room slammed shut and locked. The porter, frightened and unsure of what to do, carefully tried to find their way through the pitch black room to the door. As they slowly moved, they heard the sink in the room suddenly turn on full blast, 
After about 10 minutes in the darkness, they finally were able to free themselves from the room, shaking and unsure of what had just happened. I would definitely not be taking my break in that room anyway. <laughs> then there's the uh, spirit in the filing room. Well, this seems harmless, right? Nope, there's some undertones that can only make you think about a certain ghost in the New York City Library uh, from Ghostbusters. For my part, I hope that, that I haunt someplace more interesting than a filing room when it comes time for that, because I am required to haunt, as are you. And you. I didn't see that part of the contract, but I believe you. <laughs> it was written in invisible blood. Oh, gosh. Where'd you get invisible blood? I had my ways. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> Do you really need to be contractually obligated? I mean, no. Yeah, but exactly. Uh, there we, we, all know you're gonna, <laughs> we all know you're going to hang out with Poe and Elmira. Oh, yeah. So, anyway. Then there's Joe. Joe was a morgue employee who died while on the job. While this uh, turn of events certainly made for a very short commute for the coroner, it seemed that Joe wasn't quite finished with his workplace. The lights in the morgue will sometimes turn on and off, while accompanied by laughter that can only be attributed to the infamous Joe. While we hope you never need to be admitted to St. Michael's Hospital in downtown Toronto, just be aware, if you manage to get a single room, you're probably not alone. Hi, sir. You've been snagged. <laughs> oh, there he goes. <laughs> His beloved. <laughs> He does love that thing. To a fault. <laughs> to a fault. When it shows up in bed at 3 a.m. 3 o'clock in the, yeah. 3, 3.30 in the morning. Whose fault? Well, no, like, who, who, who's at fault there? I feel like that's your fault for sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we're try trying to wear him out before we go to bed. <laughs> Yesterday we woke him up several times during the day just to get him moving and get him playing. We were so told they, to make him play more by the vet too, by the yes, way. Yes, <laughs> yeah, the, the vet said to do as much, but um, yeah. Just so he would sleep a little bit more last night too, which thankfully he did. Which meant we got to sleep more last night. Anyways, just around the corner from St. Michael's Hospital stands a different kind of institution. The Elgin and Winter Garden Theater. This grand, theater, uh, this grand theater, or theaters, depending on how you want to look at it, was opened in 1913 and originally named Lowe's Young Street Theater. The 992-seat Winter Garden Upper Theater was closed in 1928 and for all intents and purposes sealed off. The 1561-seat Elgin Theater, which is the lower theater, with its high domed ceiling, served as a cinema for a time, with most of the movies shown geared to a more adult audience. The theaters were oh. yeah. The theaters were purchased by the Ontario Heritage Association in 1981 and designated a national historical site in 1982. In 1987, when renovations were started, a plethora of things were discovered in the sealed portion of the theater, including old playbills and ticket stubs and costumes from 60 years before, which the employees described as a sens sensation of walking into a time machine. The theaters were lovingly restored with the black paint and wear of the Elgin cleared away and returned to its beautiful original design and the Winter Garden back to its unbelievable former glory as one of the most unique and beautiful theaters in the world. The theaters were officially reopened to the public in 1989, and they stand as the last double-decker or stacked Edwardian theater facility in the world. As a historic, unique, and still operable facility, it seems that some guests and crew from generations past may still linger here today. Reports include how a workman in the theater's um, how a workman in the theater watched once as a group of theater seats in the Winter Garden folded down as if an unseen audience had just sat down to watch a performance, and then moments after returned to their normal position. The hand-operated elevators, which supposedly require an operator to move, will suddenly start up by themselves and go uh, to various floors for no apparent reason. All the staff have either experienced this for themselves or know someone closely who has. 
One thing that one staff member admitted to is that an apparition of a woman in an Edwardian clothing will appear in the lobby and remain long enough to be witnessed by a few before disappearing. Staff do not know who this woman is or why she's still lingering, but it's safe to say that enough reports have come in to grant the apparition some credence. Some of the volunteers doing the renovation conducted a session with a Ouija board. Haunts of Richmond does not endorse the use of Ouija boards. Anywhere. Anytime. Any story. Anyways. We digress. Kind of. Almost as soon as they started. A ghost named Samuel identified himself. He had been a trombone player in 1918 and had passed away by falling into the orchestra pit at the Elgin. The volunteers asked if there were any other spirits there. He said yes, but when they asked to talk to them, he refused to put them in touch. Then there is the interesting part of the theater's lore that, while not ghostly, is a little hard for us to pass up. When the theater was being restored in the 1980s, the staff was meticulous in adhering to the structure's historical accuracy. They contacted the Biograph Theater in Chicago, which would have had theater seats very similar to those originally used in the Elgin Winter Garden. The restoration staff purchased several, and they were shipped to Toronto. When they arrived, one chair seemed inexplicably to be upholstered in a different color. So the staff had it upholstered to blend in with all the others. Shortly thereafter, they were in touch with the staff of the Biograph Theater again and were informed of the reason for the different upholstery. The chair had been given its unique color to indicate that it was the last theater chair occupied by the notorious American gangster, Don Dillinger. The infamous bank robber and murderer was gunned down outside the Biograph Theater on July 22, 1934, at about 10.30 p.m. So, lost somewhere in the expanse of seats at the Elgin and Winter Garden is Don Dillinger's last chair, a seat any theatergoer could very well be using at any show. Huh. Mm -hmm. Great. Almost. Now, of course, we can't do Toronto without talking about some haunted government buildings, and we're going to talk about Old City Hall. Now, this is not the same Old City Hall that was attached to the St. Lawrence Market. This is the Old City Hall that actually replaced the old Old City Hall. Yeah. They've had a few City Halls. They should have Original City Hall, Old City Hall, and yeah. They've done a pretty decent job of keeping many of these buildings and kind of repurposing them. So. There's several versions of City Hall. There's current City Hall, there's old City Hall, there's old, old City Hall. That's not what they really call it, but that's what I'm just saying. I think it should be original City Hall. I'll let you go ahead and write them a letter and make that suggestion. Just saying. <laughs> hey, Canada, this is an American here. Tell me how you this can be English yourself. teacher. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so architect E.J. Lennox designed some of Toronto's most notable landmarks, including uniquely bizarre Old City Hall. Lennox was a fan of Romanesque revival architecture, and his work at the Old City Hall embraced this style and gave it a sharp, dark twist. Delays, cost overruns, of course, will slow the construction of this building from the get-go, starting in 1889, when the project would take a 12 long years, excuse me, the project would then take 12 long years to complete. City officials were refused to pay Lennox after the project went over budget. He responded by enlisting masons working on the site to carve grotesque caricatures of the city's councillors over the pillars on either side of the main entryway. Lennox continued the ghoulish modifications atop the clock tower where a giant winged gargoyles were added and one decided to take flight in the 1930s, crashing through the roof. That led to the decision to remove them in 1945, along with the two grotesques and antique lampposts that were at the base of the grand staircase inside. The gargoyles would be replaced with a lighter weight replica in 1999 to mark the builder's centennial. By then, Old City Hall had outgrown its usefulness as the city's municipal offices and plans to construct a new uh, Plans to begin the construction of Eaton Center across the street in 1965 called for the building to be demolished and replaced with retail complex. 
Public outcry would eventually halt those plans, but Old City Hall would continue to carve out an inauspicious history for itself as the city's main courthouse. Lennox, meanwhile, would never get paid for his work, nor was he granted a plaque on the building after its initial construction, crediting him with the design of the building, a common feature on many major projects even in the modern day. Not to be denied, Lennox had the mason sign his name in stone in the corbels beneath the upper floor eaves around the perimeter of the building. A ground level plaque commemorating his efforts would eventually be erected on the site in the 1970s. His great work would be declared a National Historic Site in 1984. Beneath the Romanesque and Gothic facade of the structure hide spectral stories of varying sorts. The rear staircase has a poltergeist that seems to enjoy tugging at judges' robes as well as walking up and down the stairs where its footsteps can be heard. Like the previous municipal center that was at the St. Lawrence Market, the cellars at the new Old City Hall acted at one time as holding centers for prisoners. The pitiful moans of the incarcerated long since past can still be heard today. Courtroom 33 is said to be haunted by the spirits of the last men condemned to hang in Canada, convicted murderers Ronald Turpin and Arthur Lucas. They were executed at the Don Jail just after midnight on December 11th in 1962. The men's spirits dominate the courtroom where their fate was sealed. They don't seem to be quite alone. It's believed some of the honorable judges that have presided over the courtroom seem to stop in and uh, show themselves. Of course, they also try to keep those that they have condemned in check. It's almost a tradition for someone in the press to attempt to spend the night in the courtroom on Halloween. John Robert Colombo's book, Haunted Toronto's, uh, tells of a pair of determined reporters that almost managed to spend the night, but gave in by 4 a.m. The reporters talked of cool fogs, weird noises that left them, and at times, well, they got themselves glued to the floor by something. They were petrified. Yeah. For many years, Toronto's old city hall served as the Justice Center for the Providence of Ontario, but there seems to be plans in the works to turn it into a city museum in the near future. This would, of course, provide access to the general public as it's never been experienced before. So if you want to try to go and say hello to the spirits at Old City Hall, keep an eye out on the news for that subject. You may get a chance soon. All right, so we're going to be moving just a few blocks to the northeast of Old City Hall, where stands a rather unassuming townhouse that would be fairly easy to overlook were it not for the historic marker and museum signage that's on it today. Mackenzie House stands at 82 Bond Street and was the home of Toronto's first mayor, William Lyon Mackenzie a man who was equally as famous for leading a rebellion to overthrow British rule. Oh well, yeah, honestly, probably maybe a smidge more famous for that, honestly. He'd be famous Canada-wide for that. Yeah. He was a, he was a little bit of a fire starter. We could probably, I could talk about him at length. He was so, quite the character. So, you see up there with Benedict? Uh, no. No, not quite that high. Now, not, not quite elevated to that level, but he was definitely an interesting gentleman. So, and, and, well, after the whole rebellion thing didn't quite pan out, he did wind up staying a little stint across the border in New York, and one of his daughters was born in Rochester, my hometown. Yes. Anyways. Hometown connection. Yeah. That's a, I, I know, that's a stretch, but anyways. So, Mackenzie moved into the Bond Street home in 1859, and he died in his second-floor bedroom in 1861. Mackenzie's wife, Isabel, died 12 years later. Mackenzie's body is buried at Toronto Necropolis, but some believe his spirit returns to his former home. In the 1940s, a private foundation was set up to preserve the Mackenzie House as a historic location, and it was opened to the public as a museum in 1950. The museum is quite open about the building's haunted nature, selling ghost-related t-shirts and books in the gift shop. The ghostly tales surrounding the Mackenzie House started with the opening of the museum, when it was staffed by live-in caretakers. One of these caretakers was Mrs. Edmund. Uh, she came forward with a story that made headlines across the city. 
Mrs. Edmund claimed that one night she was awakened by a soft touch on the shoulder. When she opened her eyes, Mrs. Edmund said that there was a lady there bending over and looking into her face. But a few seconds later, the lady vanished. A few weeks later, Mrs. Edmund claimed it happened again, but this time Mrs. Edmund said the lady drew back her hand and slapped her in the face before vanishing. Bruce Beaton, uh, yeah, Beaton, uh, Bruce Beaton, a historical interpreter at Mackenzie House, said that while he has never encountered paranormal activity himself, stories of hearing footsteps on the creaking stairs or the spontaneous playing of the piano in the parlor have lingered along with other ghostly accounts. Some of these tales revolve around William Lyon Mackenzie himself. Aside from his political work, Mackenzie was a journalist. He had a newspaper called The Colonial Advocate. Some think that it is Mackenzie who is responsible for sometimes operating the print TV press in the museum late at night. The late mayor has also been spotted in his bedroom and at his work desk by many people over the years. What really threw the Mackenzie house into the paranormal spotlight was an event that was held there in 1960. An exorcism of sorts was held there and was recorded to air on television. While some might consider this a bit of a questionable decision, it succeeded in making the museum an even bigger draw for fans of supernatural phenomena. In the same year as the exorcism, the house was donated to the city of Toronto. Part of this bequest was an inventory of all the artifacts that were in the house at that time. And at the bottom of this list were the words, One Ghost. Beaton, the historical interpreter, found this to be quite amusing and alarming at the same time. It was only the second occurrence of ghosts being listed in an official government document in Canada. The other has to do with the Toronto Lighthouse's plaque, a separate story that we'll circle back to shortly. An archdeacon was then brought in to perform a blessing on the house to perhaps try and calm the restless spirit. Whether the spirit or spirits were calmed or not, they are still kicking around Mackenzie House today. To this day, there are still eerie reminders of Mackenzie, his wife, and some children. The apparition of a small, bald man in a wig and frock coat is often seen around the home, especially in the bedroom. This would be an apt description of the leg mayor. Also, a woman with long hair has been spotted around the second and third floor areas. Cold spots, poltergeist activity, and footsteps continue to be reported by the staff and many of the tourists. One of the more interesting things that the ghosts have taken a liking to is not original to the house. That would be the indoor plumbing. Toilets flush spontaneously and taps are regularly turned on without the help of any corporal hands. A visitor to the Mackenzie House recalled their own hair-raising experience from a visit to the museum with their father and sister. As she was going up to the second floor, she had a weird sensation come over her, prompting her to look into the second room where she saw a young girl, roughly in her early teens, standing by the dresser. She was convinced that she was looking at one of Mackenzie's daughters, as the name Elizabeth popped into her head. Whether it was Elizabeth or another daughter could be up for debate. Mackenzie and his wife had 13 children together, 10 of them daughters, two of which were named Elizabeth. Of all the children, only six made it to adulthood, four daughters, and two sons. It's also worth noting that, the Mackenzie, that Mackenzie's mother was also named Elizabeth, though there is no obvious reason for her to appear in the Mackenzie house, as she never would have seen the house, let alone lived there as a young woman. That is, unless she had a message for her descendants. Upper Canada history had this to say of Elizabeth Mackenzie, William's mother. She was sober and fiercely serious by nature, her features reflecting the furies fighting within her. She was a zealous Calvinist and extremely superstitious. The mystical was very real to her. She believed that every occurrence in her life augured well or ill. She thought that with the death of every member of the Mackenzie clan, an omen was delivered. It came to surviving members of the family on the lips of a ghostly messenger whose visitation was accompanied by a strange, eerie sound. So, maybe, maybe she decided to take on the uh, role of this messenger herself. That is certainly up for debate. Now, though William Lyon Mackenzie only lived in the home on Bond Street for a couple of years before his death, 
there is little debate that he brought with him a wealth of energy and chaos, both personal and professional, and that has left a lingering imprint on this otherwise unassuming structure in the heart of Toronto. All right, so we mentioned the lighthouse. Um, this is, of course, a lighthouse that was commissioned in 1803, the Gibraltar Point Lighthouse. It was one of three erected with the intention to bolster the town of York's defenses, while tensions remained uneasy between northern British holdings and the newly established United States. Gibraltar Point was named for the world-famous strategic territory overseeing the strait between Spain and Morocco. The peninsula in Lake Arteria was thought to have a similar purpose as a powerful fortifying point intended to protect British traveling vessels. By 1808, the construction was complete and the Gibraltar Point Lighthouse was brought fully into service. Quickly, the lighthouse saw considerable action, standing as sentinel during the War of 1812 and standing as direct witness to the 1813 Battle of York. Over its lifetime, the lighthouse watched York become the city of Toronto and the peninsula it stood on transferred into Toronto Islands. Today, the Gibraltar Point Lighthouse is the oldest standing lighthouse on the Great Lakes. While being a storied landmark for the Toronto area, the Gibraltar Point Lighthouse also has a grim chapter in early history. The very first lighthouse keeper at Gibraltar Point was a German immigrant by the name of John Rodemuth Rattle Mueller. Serving from 1809 to 1815, Rattle tenure at the lighthouse came to an abrupt and mysterious end as he disappeared on January 2nd of 1815. Speculation about what may have happened seems to be nearly endless, but there's one narrative that has become the most prominent. As the story goes, the keeper was an amateur distiller back in Germany. Bringing this knowledge to the Americas, he became a rather popular among the sailors and the soldiers in the area. One night, upon visiting the lighthouse, a few soldiers became a bit rowdy for after a few too many drinks. While Rod Mueller threatened to cut them off for the night, things turned violent. Outnumbered, he was beaten and eventually murdered by the drunken soldiers. To hide their crime, the soldiers buried the lighthousekeeper's body in pieces around the lands surrounding the lighthouse before making their escape. While a couple of soldiers faced accusations associated with the disappearance in 1815, those accusations never led to a conviction, and the case was never brought to a close. It's important to note that as much of this is conjecture, the soldiers that committed the crime wouldn't exactly be boasting about their deed. There would not have been any other witnesses in attendance. And that said, there have been stories of subsequent light keepers discovering bones hidden in a crawl space and buried around the island. By the time the lighthouse was formally decommissioned in 1957, the tales surrounding what might have happened that night have become Toronto's local lore. Urban legends claim that the lighthouse is one of the most haunted landmarks in the city of Toronto, with the ghost of its first keeper still loyally serving in the defense of York. Many visitors claim to see the ghostly shadow of, uh, of the gate, excuse me, the lighthouse keeper still going about his work. Others have felt the floors of the old lighthouse complex shift and rattle under their feet, as if disembodied and hidden limbs of the keeper were attempting to crawl forth and seek out the light of day. <laughs> Miko is. <laughs> yes, I believe. Although it's closed to the public throughout the year, people are free to visit the lighthouse by foot or along the bike tour of Toronto's islands. If you approach the lighthouse, you can see the official historic marker attached to the building by the Ontario Archaeological and Historic Sites Board that notes of the story of the keeper and his reputation as a haunted building. It really, it really is kind of interesting seeing that as, you know, official historic marker with this. You have yeah. a ghost here, yes. by the way. Yeah. Really kind of cool. Anyways, we're next going to go ahead and bring our attention back to the city center with a visit to the home of the Law Society of Ontario, Osgood Hall. Construction on Osgood Hall began in 1829, although there have been many additions to the building since that time. It was named for William Osgood, who was the first Chief Justice of Upper Canada. 
The building has always been used by the Law Society of Upper Canada, but also housed the Osgood Hall Law School from 1889 to 1968. This collection of bizarre occurrences at Osgood Hall has come to us directly from the records of the Law Society of Ontario, piquing our interest just a little more than usual. It's not often that the law touches on the spooky side of things. It's kind of hard to prove those things. <clears throat> The historic Great Library at Osgoode Hall is the largest law practitioner's library in Canada and is often full of students putting in long hours of legal research. So it wasn't entirely surprising when one Sunday in the 1960s, the head librarian found a studious fellow hard at work even though the library was closed. Not wanting to disturb him, the librarian headed to his office to go about his day. He later returned to the library to see the man get up walked to the exit, and vanished through the door. Years later, a figure was again spotted in the library at an odd hour, this time by a night custodian. The figure was sitting near the fireplace around 11 o'clock at night, well after the library was closed. Dealing with trespassers was not in the custodian's job description, so he called security to report the mysterious man. Security only confirmed that they had cleared the building after it had closed for the evening, and when the custodian went back to where the figure had been sitting, it had vanished. Another night in the early 1990s brought quite a fright to a member of the security team. While walking through the library, the employee suddenly heard rumbling and saw lights dancing across the window, or across the walls, rather. The bookshelves began to shake violently, causing several law texts to fall to the ground. He then saw the statue that normally looks up to the ceiling was suddenly staring directly at him. He dashed out, heart racing. He later tried to rationalize that perhaps it was a streetcar causing the commotion, but that was the only night in his 36 years at the Law Society that something like that had happened. Somebody was summoning. Yeah. <laughs> totally summoning. Then there was the former superintendent of Osgood Hall who was staying late one evening. While walking the building to, in the dead of night, he came upon Convocation Hall, expecting it to be empty, but he was instead greeted by the sounds of a raucous, of raucous voices at what seemed like a lively reception. Concerned that he wasn't notified of a late night event, he entered the hall only to find it empty, lights off, and the furniture undisturbed. Then there are the reports of a woman in a white dress. She has been seen several times in Convocation Hall, weeping at the foot of one of the portraits hung high on the walls, her identity an enduring mystery of the institution. The paranormal doesn't check itself at the doors that lead to the historical parts of Osgood Hall. There have been several reports of unexplained occurrences in newer wings as well, from dictation machines mysteriously switching on to bathroom doors slamming and paper towel dispensers churning with no one operating it seems the ghosts of Osgood Hall like to stretch their legs from time to time and tour the entire building. Alright, so now we're going to go on to the Hotel Promise that Chris and I have stayed at. This is the Fairmont Royal York Hotel. It's a few blocks to the south approaching the Toronto Lakefront. The prestigious hotel first opened up in June of 1929, and it was built by the Canadian Pacific Railroad across from the city's bustling Union Station. But before the Royal York was built, there were two previous hotels that sat upon the site in downtown Toronto. One of the city's most enduring landmarks at one time, excuse me, the tallest building in the Commonwealth, and the Royal York's opulence survives even though it's been dwarfed by, well, let's just say, a lot of other buildings in the area. The luxury hotel aimed to attract the rich and the famous to come for a stay, and this was the goal, and it succeeded in achieving it. After all, we've stayed there a couple times ourselves. And go back in a heartbeat. The rich and famous. <laughs> <laughs> At the time of the hotel's opening, it was hailed as the state-of-the-art hotel featuring ten elevators, a radio in each room, a private bath for each of its guests, 
The structure was made even bigger in the 1950s, and once construction was complete, the Royal York boasted of 1,600 rooms, <laughs> earning the title of the biggest hotel in the Commonwealth. Do -do -do -do. Its reputation was so great that when the members of the royal family visit Toronto, they choose to reside at the Royal York. Mm -hmm. An entire floor of the hotel is reserved especially for them, including the aptly named Royal Suite. So I actually I did a little more digging into that. They also completely block off the floor below yep. as well, and I think above. I don't know if there is one above the royal floor, but in any case, they basically... They, you are not allowed to go anywhere near that. They inhabit one floor, they block off the floor below it, and it actually, it's blocked, both floors are blocked off for two full weeks before they arrive as well. So nobody can plant anything, hide themselves, yeah. etc. They take it seriously. Which, I mean, I suppose you should. If it's royalty, yeah, you should. Anyway, over the years... The Royal York has garnered the haunting reputation that it has today. Many of the stories were catalogued by author Christopher Hurd, who checked into the Royal York on June 7th of 2009 and proceeded to live there for several years. Hurd recalled his, recalled his experience uh, that you tend to make coarse friends with the maids and the doorman and the pool attendant that you see every single day. They become your world, and it's okay. It's a surrealistic thing, because these people, they're looking after you. They're taking care of you. They're not just people you see. They're not neighbors. As an author, this residency was a gold mine for him. He noted when you're out there looking for a story, you have to go looking for stuff. Here, I just stand in the lobby and they find me. That said, sometimes her doesn't even have to leave his room. On one occasion, he woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of children running up and down the hall laughing. After this continued for some time, he got up, went to the door, and looked out and from the people. The running and the laughing continued, but he saw no one. Confused, he opened the door, and he was met with silence. A few months later, a doorman told him that the sound of unseen children was common complaint for the guests, as uh, is the man who is wearing a purple jacket who haunts the eighth floor. <laughs> it is cuddle time. Aww. Okay, but are you going to read with me? Here we go. Alright, so, uh, the guy on the 8th floor, just think of him as someone like me. Check in one day and never left. Heard uh, collected more tales over the years as well, both from staff and guests, including the loud and disembodied footsteps on certain stairwells, phantom screams, and the feeling of being watched. Better not be in the bathroom. <laughs> the hotel's former crystal ballroom, which was closed permanently years ago, has been known for something of a hot spot of paranormal activity. Staff service elevators open up the room at random intervals, and guests staying in the rooms below have complained of music and sounds of a party coming from the empty room. Dude, that's my shoe. He loves it. You stepped on something. <laughs> that shoe is old. Anyway, uh, of course, these are parallels that are drawn between the Royal York's Crystal Ballroom and the infamous Overlook, Post, Overlook Hotel's Gold Room in Estes Park, Colorado. Who knows, maybe we have a portal between the two. Maybe. That would be cool, by the way. Walk through one, end up in the other, walk back. That'd be pretty sweet. It would be very sweet. Another regularly reported spirit is seen floating around the hotel on the 19th floor. Those who have seen him see you can only see his upper body, and that the apparition has no legs. The, <clears throat> the top floors of the hotel where he is often seen has the electrical equipment and maintenance rooms. There is no public access to this area, so it's just under video surveillance. Workers near the staircase leading up to the roof have heard footsteps, screaming. But security videos show no sign of anyone in the area. This is thought to be the apparition of the former banquet worker who was found hanging in the stairwell of the 19th floor, an area where meeting rooms are held. So if you get a chance to stay in Toronto, we highly recommend the Royal York. It's near the top of your list. And of course, that's where we'll be staying the next time we go. Maybe we'll get a spooky experience this time. Maybe. I will say it's super convenient. 
It is, because literally you walk out of Union Station and it's there. It's right across the street. It's Actually, so easy. And I say across the street, you don't have to cross the street. There's a tunnel. A tunnel underneath that basically you come right up into Boy. the lobby of the Royal York. It was very convenient. It was extremely convenient. All right, so Chris's final stop because I had to put some booze in here. Me, I had to alcohol. We love. Booze. I mean, when you have a place that's called the Distillery District, I mean, you gotta include it. Our show runs on alcohol, so mm -hmm. and cats and, and cats. cats and cats, and you can't really see them against. And I guess right. ghosts, so maybe like ectoplasm or something. Yeah, yeah. There's that too. Of course, there's the ghosts. Cheers, everybody. Anyway, so, <laughs> final stop. Distillery District. Just a stone's throw from the harbor, the Distillery District is one of Toronto's oldest neighborhoods. Today, the brick-lined streets are home to modern shops and restaurants that have moved into the old distillery and industrial buildings of the area. It can be quite the charming area to spend an afternoon and a good chunk of change, and carries the weight of its history well. It's really of no surprise that there are some spirits lingering on in this corner of the Toronto landscape. The Gooderhem and Wartz Distillery began in 1837 when English immigrant James Wartz and his brother-in-law William Gooderman expanded their flour mill near Toronto's waterfront to include a distillery. James Wartz unfortunately didn't live to see the boom years of his business. Only three years after arriving, his wife and child died in childbirth. One morning not long after, Wartz's body was found at the bottom of a well which once stood on the site. No one knows for sure what happened, but since his tragic death, many believe that Wartz never left the business he started. Over the years, there have been numerous sightings of a spirit on the streets of the distillery district. When the site was undergoing renovations to open to the public, the workers would often report seeing the shadowy figure of a man wandering the grounds as they worked up on the roofs. These sightings were usually very early in the morning when there were few people around. Numerous businesses throughout the area have told tales of employees noticing the man standing at the window of their shops in old-fashioned clothing. Whenever they looked again, no one was there. Perhaps the spirit is that of James Wards continuing to over oversee work in his distillery even after his death. James is far from alone in, haunting of, in the haunting of this old neighborhood. You see, when the old distillery was up and running in the 1830s, mice would regularly eat the grain that, used to, that was used to make whiskey. So cats were often employed to take care of the mouse population in exchange for shelter. This practice is still used today, with several breweries taking on a cat staff member. So now, only a few times a year in the middle of the night, you might just see several of the gray or white blurry ghosts of the vigilant cats running around the distillery still on the prowl for mice looking to partake in the distillery's delicious grain. And that, ladies and gentlemen, does bring us to a close for Haunted Toronto. Yes. Yay. That Haunted University is part two in two weeks. Yes. So, yeah, hope that, uh, hope that y'all enjoyed this evening's show. This was a fun one for us. Yep. Mm -hmm. it, it's brought back memories. It does. We need to go back to Toronto. We do. We do. But yeah, uh, so. Uh, and it won't be the last time you hear about Toronto. No, there's but, a lot up there. There's a lot, and we wound up actually having to trim a couple of stories from this episode that are getting pushed off, and they will be shared on a future episode at because some I point. Because I always have too much, which is why he edits me. Almost. It's better always. have too much than too little. Yeah. So, two weeks, Honey Universities Part 2. Mm hmm. After that, another two weeks, we're going to do Haunted Massachusetts, and there will be stories for Boston. So I know that Boston there, stories have been there, on... There's a Boston story at Haunted Universities, there's one Boston story in this other Haunted Massachusetts. Yes, yep. We so, have covered Boston a little bit before, but again, we'll get a little bit Boston more in here. Boston is just so haunted. Like, mm -hmm. even if yeah. we did like one show on just Boston, we'd have enough to sprinkle around everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so... Yes, we will have. Uh, we will be talking about Boston quite a bit there in about a month's time. Yep. You'll get a little sampling of Boston in two weeks' time, yep. and then uh, towards the end of September we will have 
get back to the state of rotation as we throw in Haunted Louisiana. Ooh! Yeah, so. And of course, we will only have one episode in October. We're going to do Witches Part 2. Yep. So, Part 2 or Part 3? Part 2. I think we've done two Witches episodes before. We only have one saved. I'm pretty sure I can find it. Okay, well, it's saved as Part 2 of okay. We've, we've done the witches a couple times. In any case, whether it's part two or part three, there will be witches talked about in October. And, I uh, second part three, because I'm pretty sure I was here for part two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh -huh. Maybe we did an international one and a uh, U.S. one. We'll get it sorted. I don't know. One, of, the, know one is... of them was very heavy on witch graves. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, but in any case... We'll get it sorted. We'll get it all sorted. And of course, we will have a ton of stuff going on between now and, you know, the end of September, let alone October. Okay. Which is filling up quickly. October's going to be crazy. And they just they... announced that Richard Dreyfus is going to be at Nightmare Weekend. Yep. So, yep. I'm so yeah. excited. <laughs> that, that's going to be awesome. We will be there at um, Nightmare Weekend all weekend long. That's the 13th through 15th. And we will be doing three panels where we will talk about um, it'll be stuff that we've talked about on the show yeah. over the years. So we're gonna we're repurposing some of the material that we've shared on some of these shows. But we're gonna be doing a, a talk on vampires, a talk on werewolves, and a talk on creepy dolls. So three talks, and you can come see us at our merch table down there on the vendor floor all weekend long. But that is, it'll be here before we know. Who am I yeah, kidding? We're... It's about two months out. Oh my god. As a matter of fact, no, oh. it is two months out Guys, because I looked... we'll be in the middle of that weekend two months from today. Yeah. I look at the cam calendar. We're already in the middle of August. Yeah. Yep. I'm so excited about pumpkin spice. <laughs> <laughs> it is Not. coming. Pumpkin spice is coming. Pumpkin spice is already here. Who am I kidding? Mm -hmm. You can go to the grocery store and some of the larger like beer brands already yeah. have their, their pumpkin beers out. Yeah, yeah. Like the like, only like pumpkin spice I want are pumpkin spice covered pretzels. They are those are like crack. Where do I get those? Uh, well, we used to get them from Farm Fresh over by Park. Is it Park? I don't know. Yeah, on the way to the vet. That's where I, the, the market is. Fresh, Fresh Market. Fresh Market. Oh, okay. Yeah, Fresh Market over there is where we used to get them from. Gotcha. I don't know if there's anybody else closer that's doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could try. Uh, there, yeah. Probably, I just oh, haven't shoot. told you yet. I was going to bring you guys some pumpkin spice cookies. Okay. You know where we live. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, um, we'll be back and check in here with you again in a couple of weeks. But, mm -hmm. again, in the next couple of weeks, got a lot going on. Of course, there's tours just about every night, including, uh, and then there's the Comic-Con this mm -hmm. coming Saturday at the Richmond Raceway. You can go see Lee and Marsha there and pick up some spooky merch. And then John, right, Marshall House. John Marshall House the Saturday after that, basically right before we come back and do our next Facebook Live. So yeah. if you guys come to the Virginia Comic Con booth, I am going to be talking about John Marshall House a lot. Because <laughs> that is my favorite thing we do. <laughs> Just talking spooky stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. That's what we live for. Oh, I mean, specifically, I like, I like the John Marshall House stories. It is... Fantastic. It's a lot of fun to we, do those. we really love partnering with the John Marshall House, and it's a great event. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, definitely hope you can come on yeah. out and check that out with us because, again, it'll probably be at least a few months before we're able to go ahead and get it back on the calendar. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're going to be busy, guys. Mm -hmm. yep. We're going to be busy. <laughs> so. so, anyways, yeah, with all that said, we're going to go ahead and uh, check on out for this evening. Mr. Nico says, Good night, everybody. Say good night. Spicy. Yeah. Oh, oh, spicy. He's going to kill me. For <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Excuse you, sir. Thank you for watching. Bye, and y'all have a good one. Bye. Bye.